Welcome to episode seven of the Haskell Cast. I'm Rain Hendricks with my co-host Chris Forno. Our guest today is Chris Doan. Chris is the author of the Fay Library, Haskell Mode, and Structured Haskell Mode for Emacs and TryHaskell.org. So welcome, Chris. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Usually, uh, we start out by asking folks how they got into Haskell, uh, so we'd like to do that with you as well. Okay, so I got into Haskell around 2008, and I'd, I'd used C basically for five years, and I loved C, and I lived in C. And then I discovered Scheme randomly. Um, some guy introduced it to me, and uh, it had lambdas and things, and uh, that was really interesting. And then one day I was uh, scheming around on the IRC channel of Scheme, uh, you know, using call with con current continuation and stuff like that. And then I saw a paste, um, which was a Haskell implementation of Scheme. And it was maybe 200 lines of Haskell. And I basically understood it without knowing Haskell. It was, it was using pattern matching and data types and GADTs and stuff, uh, ADTs. And yeah, I just, I thought that is a language I've got to learn. Uh, you know, when you see a language like right now for Haskellers, the thing like that is Idris. Right? Haskellers are looking at Idris in the distance and thinking, hmm, interesting. And that was the same for me with Haskell. So I, I knew I had to learn it. So then um, one, it was New, New Year's Eve on, I guess, 2009. And I just and learned it. Uh, yeah, and that was that was pretty much it. Uh, you mentioned uh, you saw a paste, and uh, that reminds me that I think you were behind H paste and, and possibly also L paste as well. Oh yes, yes, H paste, uh, which moved to L paste recently, well, about a year ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. I maintain that right now. Yeah, I've seen that you maintain uh, quite a number of things, and I was uh, taking a look at uh, tryhaskell.org. And um, thinking, you know, how is he maintaining all these things? And when I looked at the code for TriHaskell, I was rather surprised that really the core of it is what, a few hundred lines of Haskell and a few hundred lines of JavaScript? Yeah, it's really simple now. Yeah. It used to be a complete mess when I first wrote it when I was a newbie. And then a few months ago, I rewrote it with Move Out Core. Uh, you know, the Move Out library, which Lambda uses? I use that, and uh, it's really simple. Yeah. So, so Louisville, is this is this related to the, um, the sort of Haskell spin-off language new that's being used in, I think it's uh, standard charted to update access mm -hmm. So this, this is different. This is, that's cool, but this is just a, it's, <clears throat> it's a program that uses Hint to safely evaluate Haskell code. So LambdaBot uses it, and it was written by Gwern Bannon. I hope I pronounce his name right. Name drop. <laughs> and is is this is this in any real, any way related to uh, what FP completes uh, IDE does for safe evaluation of server? Is that all handled using containers? It's using containers. Yeah, they are implemented differently, even though the use cases are quite similar. Yeah, they're they're separate. You can do arbitrary I.O. inside an FB complete container. Or just uh, use all the memory. It's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you so also interestingly, uh, Fay is relatively simple looking through, you know, the source. I'm surprised by how little there is of it. <laughs> right. Indeed. That that was part of the aims, yeah, of the original project. Uh, it, yeah. Uh, should I get into like the history of yeah, that? That was probably what we we're going to ask you next. Okay, cool. Yeah, uh, originally, I want I, I looked into GHCJS and I looked into UHC and YHC, um, and I thought YHC was pretty cool because you can compile to JavaScript with YHC. Um, the only problem is you can't compile YHC. So um, it's kind of bit rotted. <laughs> so yeah, uh, UHC works. And when I tried it, it was pretty stable, um, but just not stable enough. Uh, it puts in really large code, uh, which was the same for GHCJS at the time. And uh, it, it, it was a lot of work, I thought, to bring those up to scratch for sort of 
production. And I think that's pretty much true. I mean, it's been a couple of, a couple of years um, that Loita and McKenzie have been hacking on GHCJS to bring it up to speed, and now it, I think it's about ready. But anyway, so I, I started Fay, and originally I wanted to use the GHC API because with the GHC API, you can access type information, and you have a parser. You, you have everything you need, really, to handle Haskell code. Um, the only problem was that the GHC API was rather difficult to figure out. You know, it's not documented. It's not really an API. It's more of a, an exposure. Uh, but um, I wanted to use the, the GHC API to parse some Haskell, get all the types for every part of the AST, including resolving type classes, and then I would be done, right? I just need to do the code check. Um, but I, I found it difficult to get that to work, and so I thought, okay, Haskell Source EXT is the library, is really easy to use. It's got really simple uh, data types. You know, any Haskell newbie can look at that library and immediately see what Haskell consists of uh, syntactically. So I ended up using that, and that's really what has simplified the Haskell code base um, of Faye just by using that parser. And uh, now it actually also uses Haskell names for name resolution. So um, the only really um, complex part of Faye is the code generation, which is not really even that complex like that. So it's a small code base. Have you, have you uh, used it yourself in the thing of um, just a significant size, and this is not to pick on you, but I noticed when I looked at the code for uh, Try Haskell, for example, it doesn't seem to be written. <laughs> right. Yeah, for Try Haskell, it was written before I wrote Fay years ago, and uh, most of the code is the actual tutorial. And um, I do actually plan to write as well. I'm just not yet. So that will happen. Um, yeah, Faye, I originally wrote with the intention of being production ready uh, itch. So I wrote it in a few weekends, and then I started using it in production at the company I worked at, uh, um, which was fine. It was working. I kind of replaced one page of a whole website, which had a bunch of JavaScript, you know, just to test it out and see if it worked. Uh, and it did work, so that was good. I've used it on a bunch of things since, but the main application right now is the FP Complete ID, which is entirely written in Faye, the front end, anyway. And the tutorials uh, on the side. So, so compared to the other options out there, like GHC, JS, or Paste, what, what are the, I guess, strengths and weaknesses of Faye? OK. Um, OK, so Faye outputs small code. Um, very small. It's simple. You can basically see a one to two mapping of code from uh, the original Haskell to what is generated. So, you know, you, you yourself have seen that it's basically the same as the original Haskell, but with a bunch of thunk and forcing wrappers. Right? Um, so the code generation is, the generated code is simple, it's small. The compiler itself is small, which I think is actually a feature. Um, of one of these compilers that I can understand what it's generated and I can contribute to it these pretty much. Um, so those are the benefits for Faye. Also, yes, the Faye FFI is a really big deal. Um, when you're when you're writing sort of web apps, you need to use all these JavaScript libraries. You know, um, jQuery uh, maybe is one of the frameworks, and so then you need to bind. Uh, foreign functions to them, and it has to be convenient. Otherwise, you're otherwise you're you're weighing up the costs of using Haskell altogether, right? If it's if it's not convenient enough, you're thinking I should just use JavaScript. Um, so the FI makes it really easy to um, use callbacks and use native types, um, simple types like string and um, lists of things or whatever. And it's based upon UHC's FI, so I should give them due credit. They came up with this idea of having these format strings and stuff. Uh, that was not my idea, so I, I saw that. And yeah, those are the main advantages for Faye. Um, 
for, uh, okay, I'll go the other direction. For GHCJS, obviously the advantage is um, that you have type classes, you have full Haskell. So Faye does not have type classes because it doesn't do any type checking. Um, you rely on the GHC compiler to do that. Maybe I should have made that clear earlier, but okay. Uh, yeah, so GHCJS is full Haskell. It's full GHC Haskell, which is, you know, Haskell plus um, 100. So you, you can compile a lot of libraries. You can compile Faye with GHCJS. And I think, actually, the implementation of the runtime is quite nice now. It um, even has, like, STM and some surprising features. Right. Yes, right. It has threads. It has a concept of blocking I.O. and things like that. And I always is um, underneath is implemented with a continuation passing style, um, kind of well semantically. I know that underneath it, it's actually implementing a full stack and stuff in JavaScript. But um, yeah, the implementation is really nice. Uh, it's full Haskell is nice. It's rather large. Like it used to be really huge, but now it's just pretty big compared to Fay. The output and the speed, I think, is faster than Fay. Um, that's good. So yeah, that's that's GHCJS, and then in the middle it's Haste, um, because Haste, um, like GHCJS, compiles from the SDG instead of Fay, which compiles from Haskell syntax and then just some desugaring and then code gens. Um, both of these compilers use the SDG, which is, I guess I should explain this. Um, GHC, uh, GHC compiles from Haskell to Core, then to SDG then to C minus minus, and then finally uh, LLVM or assembly, I think. Um, but yeah, SDG is like core, but with um, some more th things resolved. So, you know, um, is this function fully applied, or is it created, or things like that. Anyway, so those two both compile from GHC's SDG. Is that, is that clear, or I don't know? I think so. Are you guys familiar? I know the audience maybe it's not. I'm not sure. I, I think it's I think it's clear enough to follow. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, so haste sits in the middle in the sense that it doesn't try to be GHC Haskell. So it doesn't have threads. It doesn't um, at least as far as I'm aware. It uses asynchronous um, an asynchronous way of coding like normal JavaScript. It has the FFI, which Faye and UHCJS use, which GHCJS does not have. It has the uh, Haskell FFI, so you have to do more wrappers and things like that. Um, yeah, Haste outputs small code, and it, yeah, it doesn't have any of the GHC standard libraries. It's more like Faye and its standard library, but more like GHCJS and what it supports. So it supports full Haskell 98 plus GHC extensions, but not, um, you know, GHC's runtime. So it sits in the middle. It's quite, quite nice. Yeah. How would you compare it to something like uh, some of the attempts to bring stronger typing to JavaScript, like uh, TypeScript? Right. TypeScript, PureScript, Roy, these kind of languages. Um, How much overhead is there for going through Haskell to get to JavaScript, for instance? Right, there's an overhead in two ways, I guess. There's performance overhead, and then there's uh, debugging overhead, which is a problem. If you have some problem which is outside of the scope of Haskell semantics, like if it's a Haskell exception, that's easy because you know, it's a Haskell matching error or something. But if it's um, interacting with JavaScript, then it's like when you're using the Haskell to find C and you get a seg fault, it's like that kind of experience. You have to figure out the, the mismatch between the two languages. Um, so yeah, the, the, there's the debugging kind of overhead, um, which can be acceptable, really, because you know Haskell fails less often, basically. So most of the time, if you get your FFI bindings right, you're OK. Um, and then yeah, there's the performance overhead. So either there, I guess there are, there are two applications for JavaScript. Either you're writing some kind of high performance tight loop, or you're going to write an application, like a big, massive thing, like if you can put ID or whatever. So in the case of an application, it doesn't matter how fast it is, I don't think. As long as it's not more than, say, five times slower, it's OK, I think. 
Whereas if you're going to do those type of groups, maybe those kind of um, uh, statically typed versions of JavaScript are a nice kind of, um, they're like C, um, you know. So TypeScript, PureScript, and Y, those are really nice. I like those approaches. Are, are source maps something that could help with the debugging? I think so. Yeah, it's a limited implementation of source maps for Fay uh, a few months ago. And that's good. You, you can use the debugger, for example. So you can step through expressions in Pascal, uh, like you can do with GHCI, which nobody does. Nobody uses GHCI for debugging, I guess. But you can do this. Um, I think I saw in your video, Chris, um, your second phase video, you did a little bit of stepping through the evaluation. Uh, but the only problem is, you know, you, you're stuck inside thumb sometimes, like forcing thumbs, which takes you away from the code. And that is something uh, to deal with, I think. You don't really care about going into the runtime code. You just want to see your actual Haskell code. So source maps takes a little bit better. Uh, yeah, I did a lot of implementation. HCJS doesn't have it yet, but they want it, and I'm not sure about haste. But yeah, it's a nice idea. Uh, I, I think uh, a lot of people are really interested in this topic, so I'm going to push uh, a little bit longer on it before getting into some other, some other topics. Where do you think? Sort of Haskell to JavaScript and, and compiling to JavaScript is going in the future. Uh, and where do you think uh, Fay has room for making things even better? Uh, that's a good point. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, I saw the history of JavaScript talk, uh, which was interesting, which predicted a future that everybody would be compiling to JavaScript and nobody would be using it unless they were, you know, doing legacy code. Uh, yeah, so Fay, I suppose the approach is that it doesn't depend on GHC. Um, that's probably why it's going to remain, because it's kind of nice that you just have pure Haskell implementations of a Haskell compiler. So when um, Haskell type, EXEs or Haskell typed, um, comes and is actually usable, then that will be used for, for phase uh, type class resolution, and it will be basically a full compiler. Um, when you've got that, when you get to that stage, I think the difference will be between do you want GHC, Haskell with um, the whole runtime stuff, which GHC just gives you. You can compile, you can compile like full Haskell um, programs that do terminal stuff and things, and it just kind of works. Uh, with a minimal overhead, I think. Um, but then you've got to deal with GHC. And for example, it's quite difficult to use GHCGS right now. Like, you have to get the VM and stuff. I think that'll improve over time. But right now, it's a bit of um, an impedance, whereas phase is really simple. You just compile and stop from the package. But I think it will stick around for that reason. Um, so in terms of the general sense of compiling to JavaScript. I'm, I'm interested in actually, um, is there gonna, are there going to be languages like PureScript and uh, TypeScript sticking around for the kind of low-level work where you got to do the type, loop, type loops and you know, get rid of the overhead um, of thumps and laziness and things? Uh, or whether uh, we might just use Haskell for everything and make sure that the compiler is really doing this strictness analysis correctly and things like this. I don't know, but that's an interesting area. I'm I'm interested to see where PureScript goes. Are that. we into an amazing future where we have native client, you know, like a, a VM in the browser with access to the right. browser, which we're probably not. So. That would be really nice, yeah. <laughs> the native client stuff I've been following, right, right. Also, I've actually tried compiling from uh, JHC. You know that one, AJHC. Uh, you can compile with um, mscripten. Its output because it outputs just pure C by compiler. So you can actually compile to JavaScript, and I tried that. It's just a bit slow. 
that's it. So I just, I've not used it. But yeah, that that might be an option eventually. But yeah, the native client would be nice, I agree. Yeah, I was giving Rain a chance. What do you oh, oh, sorry, Rain. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so we've talked about uh, where Faye came from and a little bit about where it's going. It's seeing also more adoption is being used in the FPE IDE, right? You're, so you're actually working on that now. Right. Yeah, available, it's being used. Available from fine internets everywhere. And <laughs> right. How has that how has that interaction been with, with Fay? Has has a lot of has it shaped the development of Fay? What's that been like to really have a great use case like that to drive the you know work on Fay? Right. Yeah, we we get real sort of requirements for the project. Um, so one thing that's coming up recently is that it's not so fast anymore. It used to be fast, but I think with the addition of name resolution, it slowed down a little bit. Um, so that's a recent thing. The FFI, of course. Um, so the FFI does additional checks now, which would be handy. So if a JavaScript function, so let's say when, when you do the FFI in Fay, uh, you write a declaration, you write the type out, and then below you write uh, an expression which contains some JavaScript. And um, if you write, say, this returns an integer, and then the JavaScript returns a string, like the number five in a string, um, this would just break everything. So now the FFI will complain that this is the wrong type. So a runtime, but still um, that kind of check is handy, because otherwise it would have gone unchecked and maybe worked in the time and not returned. But mostly, I think the big our big project we have something like fifteen thousand lines of Fay code for the um, IDE, and that mostly just stress tests every feature that's mostly that Fay supports. And so, I should mention that the project is now maintained by Adam Bergmark, and, and has been for like a year. And um, yeah, he's very interested in making sure that we test it with our big code base because <laughs> it's a good use case. Yeah. Well, so uh, speaking of big code base, um, where does uh, Haskell and its module system come into play for organizing? Code? I mean, you can organize it on the on the server side, sort of in files, but delivery to the client does. Do you just batch everything up, or does that assist with that? It would, yeah, I think it would exist. So um, it would be possible to separate the runtime and uh, separate different modules. Like, like the login system that we use on FP Complete is written in Fay. And um, the, uh, the, run, the running system for the tutorials is written in Fay. And they, that, is, that is sharing the same code as the IDE in some places. But right now, we batch everything in one thing because um, I think it's a little more efficient at compressing. Uh, if you separate things up, then you, you get less redundancy to compress, right? Uh, with gzip and with the closure compiler. And also there's a, a little bit of extra latency if you're requesting more than one object at a time, I think, in a browser. But I guess it depends on the kind of files. Yeah, so it would help with organization, but right now we just pack everything in one thing, uh, in one bulk uh, JavaScript file. Um, one thing I'll say is that it's nice to share the modules with the server. So we have a we have a really huge module of types called uh, shared types, which I think you can actually see on the package package, FB Co API and package now. Um, but the server and the client share the same set of modules, and there are a bunch of if defs for things in face supports and does not support. So you know, deriving generic and things like that, or instances. And um, yeah, they're, they're like, I don't know, 60 data types or 100, I don't know, lots. And we get this assurance. Whenever we build, we have a process which builds the server side and the client side and makes sure that if, if either of them don't build, it's because the types don't match anymore. So whenever we, we hack on a new feature, there's, 
there is a process of adding client side support and server side support, but they're always in sync. Uh, that is really nice. That's interesting because I know that one of the benefits for something like Closure Script is that you can kind of move code in between the client and the server as as closure. But yeah. uh, hearing you mention sort of types and data types that you're sharing between the client and the server, you're not necessarily sharing the same sort of algorithmic code, but you, you are sharing type definitions. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, one case you are sharing some code like. Uh, there's a kind of ACL. It's not um, a security ACL, but a, a space. ACL. And uh, we use the same code for client and server. And it's important that those are the same. So you might as well just use the same functions. So yeah, that is really nice to have. Uh, obviously, with GHCGS, I think you would have more overlap potential because it's, there's no stuff there. But that is a really good feature. So maybe let's talk about uh, switch gears for a bit. Talk about uh, try Haskell for a bit. Sure. So how did that come about? What made you decide that we needed a Haskell REPL on the internet? Uh, this was four years ago. Good question. <laughs> um, I think I saw I saw try Ruby, uh, which was pretty much the only try thing out there, and it was really cool. And it's by Y. You know that guy underscore Y from the Ruby community, and it was, really nice. it was kind of aimed at anyone, not just programmers, but a person who stumbles upon it and it says, you know, you did two plus three, amazing, good job. You know, it's like really encouraging for anybody. And so I thought, let's have that for Haskell. And I saw that um, Lambda could do evaluation, and I looked into how LambdaBot was doing evaluation, and I just used the same library and put it on a website. I had to write a console library beforehand, uh, and then that was that I did this tutorial. Uh, afterwards, I noticed that, that there were sort of uh, forks based upon the console library. So there was, now there's try closure, um, try arc even. Try GitHub is even the same console library. Uh, so th those are cool. Yeah, try Haskell. I really wanted an interactive tutorial which would not only uh, show you stuff but get you to type stuff out and uh, check your answers and stuff like that. I, I wonder, well, I should expand it more with more questions like write the code for me and I'll check it, that kind of thing. I would like that. Have you had, uh, I'm sure there's been some interest in some use of it, have you had any attacks on the general premise of allowing? remote code evaluation, uh, anyone going off in weird directions you didn't expect even if it wasn't right. uh, Not yet. Uh, if you try to do something like sum of the infinite list, it just uh, bails out after two seconds and says, sorry, try again. Uh, yeah. Nobody's tried that. Seems like MooEval does a, a good job of handling those bottoms, and I would I would guess, although I haven't tried, it's probably a lot harder to do that in many other languages. Right. I mean, uh, by comparison, Common Lisp is basically unsandboxable. It's really, really hard because every single thing, every cool feature in Lisp is about subverting something like a sandbox. You can do evaluation, change the environment. So, yeah, with, with Haskell, you just don't import I.O., and mm -hmm. that's it. And if you try to print, um, it's not even going to be run, right? It's just an expression. Yeah. And so speaking of not importing I.O., you had a, a blog post about uh, a pure <laughs> I.O. monad so that, it, so that you can construct I.O. like computations using the vocabulary of I.O. Of IO and have it not actually perform I.O. And right. my, my understanding is that that's essentially a, a free monad, yes? No? Yes, yes. Um, actually, I, I made a blog, the blog post and I linked to Russell O'Connor who did a free monad implementation of I.O. So there's a good example there. Cool. Uh, yeah. So mm -hmm. it, it seems like... Um, Free monads are, are are becoming very popular these days. Uh, have you, do you have any thoughts about that? Have you had a chance to use them? Um, only for playing. 
I haven't used them for a real thing yet. I was thinking of actually rewriting the, the Pure IO library with uh, um, a free monad in API so that you could do more stuff with it. Uh, so yeah, that might be my use case. One of the interesting things about free objects is that they're the objects where the laws hold by construction, because they're the laws that you, the, the definition comes only from the laws. Right. And so in, in some ways, they're nice, you know, sort of teaching objects, because you can say, hey, what does a monad look like? Well, it has to look something like a free monad. Right. Yeah. And so using that for, you know, what would pure IO look like? Let's you say, what's the, you know, what's the essence of monadic IO? Abstracted over your choice of, you know, how the runtime system evaluates and performs input output. In the input outputs, exceptions, maybe even threads, you can make, uh, yeah, some semantics mm -hmm. for that, and then interpret it yeah, as you like. Yeah, so I enjoyed that post, and it was, I've been seeing so many different posts on free monads, and they all approach it from a slightly different direction that it's, it's been helpful for me to get my intuition around that, too. So, so thank you for that. Oh, sure. Yeah, I, I think it's a good idea to, for me to sort of rewrite the prior in a free monad, just to have a use case to play around with it and see what comes, comes of that. Yeah. So, so this actually, and the reason I'm, I'm talking more about the teaching side of things is, is I'm very interested in how experienced Haskell programmers go about learning topics and can you talk a bit about what your you know what what tools do you have for, for learning new Haskell topics how, how do you go about doing that say you wanted to learn about a, a new Haskell topic let's say you didn't know what a free monad is what would you do um, for free monads I would read Gabrielle's tutorials but, right and also more in general abstracting over the choice of <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a simple process. I, I usually I find the tutorial and I whip I whip open GHCI, and I start with Control T in GHCI, which is get the type and thing, and I just start um, constructing expressions and looking at the type, um, or the kind as it may be, mm -hmm. and just exploring it interactively like that until um, I start, start feeling an intuition. So let's talk about this for a sec, because a lot of Has experienced Haskell programmers seem to say, it, well, well, look at the type. Look at the type and, and look at right. what the type tells you. What does the type tell you? What, what can you learn from the type? Well, I, I like this idea of um, Norman Bride, who says um, the type system shouldn't really be something that smacks you on the wrist and tells you that you did something wrong, but it should be guiding you, you know, where you want to go. And with that, you can... You can kind of get that with GACR. You can do a bit of exploratory type, so, um, typing. Um, yeah, I I do I do things in an iterative way. I, for example, if there's a function that is really funky and um, I don't know how to use it, I will do t of a function and then I will add a parameter and a parameter and a parameter until eventually I have um, a type of kind star. Right? I just mm -hmm. have the full type. And that's how I work, like that. Um, and the types that you do that, you can't really get away with that without GHCI. But um, yeah, it's it's a tricky question to answer. What, what do you think about that? Like, what, what do types do? You, as far as I a think language, that, I guess it's a language. Yeah, question, so, yeah. I I think that polymorphism is it can tell you a lot. What, how is right. the type polymorphic? What happens when you choose different instantiations? of that polymorphic type, you know, for, for different A's, what happens, right? For different B's, what happens? And, and why yeah, is, and, it, is it constrained or class, or is it mm -hmm. a pure polymorphic type, in which case nothing can happen to it if you pass it in somewhere? And yeah. does it make use of, of type classes like functor monad and things like that? In what positions, you know? Mm -hmm. So from the type of, for instance, applicative, you can tell that it has no access to the F. Right. Yeah, you, you can't do things dependent upon the values. You can't. There's no way using the uh, the type of applicative uh, applic of the of, of the apply operator to construct an f out of whole cloth, right? Well, you can't. Whereas do, with with no. a monad, you're forced to do that. 
you're forced to apply a function that does construct a monad out of whole cloth. Or in the case of Arrow, the only use case I've seen for Arrow in the real world was the Hako project, um, which is a project for making websites or blogs. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's basically a pipeline. And so Jasper van der Joicht made uh, his API with some arrows. Which, uh, what's this? Aro? Hackle? Arrow. Oh, no. Arrow. Control the arrow. Are you talking about Hackle? Arrow, aesthetic, yeah. Aesthetic, yeah. Uh, site generator? That's right. Yeah. So Arrow is that sort of generalization of Monad that never really got much traction. That's right. So I was going to say, um, yeah, now the API has changed back to Monads <laughs> for Hackle. Because, okay, yeah. It, it, it's a bit sad. There seem to be a lot of potential for, for errors, especially with the, uh, with the special notation, but actually using it in practice tends to be mm -hmm. useful. Yeah. Well, I, I think the, the interesting thing for me with Arrow is that it jumped, it sort of jumped up the abstraction chain farther than it needed to. It could have taken a stop off at something like a, a by map, lets you map over both sides of an either or you know things yeah. like that. I saw that blog post as well recently. Yeah. So maybe maybe it's it was you know, it was an overreaching generalization. Maybe that's why it didn't get as much traction. I don't know. I just found the interface difficult and I can't it took me long enough to be able to reason about monads and I never got there for arrows and I was never super motivated to. I guess motivation may be the reason that it didn't take off for me. Right. I remember being a newbie and I just dropped monads and I, I thought no it's time to learn an applicative and arrows. Mm -hmm. And I went through the tutorials and I learned them, and then I said, okay, now what? Right? What do you use these things for? Yeah. It, it is true that you basically use arrows for a, a bifunctor, right? um, for the bimap, for tuples, basically, or you know, the either. Or... So, so <laughs> I, I want to maybe steer this away for a little bit here. I know we could talk about theory a lot. I know Raymond loves that. But um, <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll let it go. It's okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I'm curious, and I hope others are, about <laughs> sort of being a working web developer in, in Haskell. And we can still be a little bit theoretical. I've seen you write a bit about Haskell DB, and this seems to be a very interesting. Oh, yeah. it's, a, it's an interesting area, right? You go into a very unsafe, what, what should be safe area of databases, and you have this strange, <laughs> sort of strange interface between. That's right. Um, so, so, what has been your experience actually using something like Haskell DB? I mean, is it is it ready for production for most people, or has it been sort of a fun thing for you? I it's not ready for production for most people. It's ready for production if you are happy to fix things um, that come up as they come up. Because when I used it. Um, Simple things like not quoting um, um, special keywords in SQL, for example, user, you should quote that if you're using you know, Postgres. Um, simple things like that, which are just basic stability issues, arose in Haskell's backends. But the, um, yeah, the actual uh, the idea behind it, the concept, is really nice. It, it has, okay, so if people don't know Haskell to be, it's a relational algebra, I suppose, for databases. Um, it's a library which defines you know, a few combinators for doing, um, yeah, it's, it's a monad. So the monad consists of doing selection, uh, restriction, projection, which means, you know, restriction is uh, where projection is take these two fields. And in the projection, um, as opposed to returning a tuple, that would be its own list implementation, basically, of um, arbitrary records which are extensible. So you can say project this field and this field, like you would in SQL, you would select um, username and age or whatever. And in the same way with Haskell DB, you can project those two fields and uh, return that stuff. And at the end of the monad, it produces some SQL which is executed, and that's it. Um, and yeah, that the the type safe side is really nice. Um, and Again, coming back to the stability, I found a bug in it, which I don't know, I don't think it was by design, but just uh, by implementation, which is that you could do an update for a field that didn't exist in your table. So I, I patched Haskell to support that properly so it would, you know, 
would stop you from trying to do that with the type system. Which was nice because I had to do a bit of type level programming. I had like a, a loop inside the type system. But anyway, I have a blog post about that. Uh, yeah. Although the monad is very interesting as well, not just for safety, but for composition. Um, so, for example, pagination is a thing that you do all the time in data. Sorry, take from here to here, take a range of the results. And that is something that you can put as a combinator and then just put at the end of your query. You can say, OK, slide this and this and this. And oh, by the way, paginate. And it will just compose properly. And the joins will happen. The types are similar to straight safe. And so, yes, it's a lot of fun to have to be. I, I think it might be important to make the distinction between or and something like active record and relational algebra in Is Lake not sort of comparable? I, I think so. I haven't actually used it, so, but I've, I've heard the comparison. Was it list comprehension? But again, yeah, list comprehension is basically like a monad. In this yeah, and it's interesting that this is sort of not really solved in, in many languages, considering that this is something that, if you go back and read Claude's early papers, he always sort of envisioned a database, a relational database working this way. It's this idea of using you know, SQL, uh, let alone using it in, in strings that you send at one time. <laughs> right. Generating strings, yeah, arbitrarily. Active record and not used. Uh, what is the difference there between active record and say? Um, I, I'm not too familiar with it, but I think the the idea that, that sort of goes, I, I guess, bringing it to Haskell, actually taking a record um, type and putting it in and out of, of the database uh, pretty simply. Um, I mean, maybe Rain can. can Ah, Rain is Ruby, right? So I, I, I yeah. For uh, it's the it's. I don't like to talk about it, but yes. <laughs> <You're past. laughs> so interest. So I, I think I'm, I'm kind of uh, honor bound to point out that database queries are, you know, highly rigorous in some ways that that make it nice to reason about. They form algebras and things, and in fact, one of the things that happened to uh, Active Record relatively recently is that the underlying query construction mechanism was turned into a relational algebra. To the extent that you could do such a thing in a language like Ruby that doesn't give you some of the nice, you know, properties that help you reason about things, so you just kind of do it by brute force. And okay, so what you would get the composition, but not the type safety. Mm -hmm. And what that's actually allowed is the ability to refactor at a sort of a, a, a higher level to rewrite a bunch of things in ways that have better asymptotics and whatnot, uh, right. that, that, that uh, use caching more effectively because you, you have better tools to reason about uh, cache evacuation and stuff like that. When do you need to cache? When is it safe to remove something, et cetera, et cetera. So because you have because you have these algebraic tools to reason about that now they've been able to make some surprising performance improvements to active records underlying this ARL thing that I think would have been difficult if not impossible without some of the rigor that they've added. Right, another benefit of rigor, performance. Yes. it lets you reason about things, and laws let you reason about things. Yeah, I should I should uh, clarify that AskoDB does not really optimize your queries, so you need to use a database like Postgres, which does your optimization for you. It, it could because it, it there's there's it's a fertile ground for sort of equational reasoning and and things like that. Definitely. One of the interesting things might be, and I don't know how it's structured internally, but if you have some sort of internal sort of recursive, you know, data type that's representing the query structure, something like plated from lens allows you to go in and do type, uh, do term replacement. So pattern match on, on a, on a subtree and replace that subtree with a different subtree. So the, the, so a simple example would be if you've got like a little addition expression language where you have literals and addition and negation, 
You can do uh, double negation elimination. You can pattern match on neg of neg of A and turn it into A. Right. Yeah. right. And, there, and there may be ways that you can use something like that very simply to just pre equations about, about things that have to be equal to each other relationally and then, then replace one for the other. Yeah, that's a nice yeah, that's a term there. I, I suspect it might be difficult to apply anything but maybe a handful of very simple optimizations to something like a, a, a database, complex database program. I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, yeah. It's yeah, nice that. Yeah, it's nice that you can start with, with such a simple tool, which is literally write a function that defines the equivalences by taking a pattern match and providing a new you know, a new subtree. Yeah. And then um, this this uniplate concept is basically the first tree, find the fixed point of applying these things until you get to something that you can't apply anything to anymore. Yeah. That's a, that's a nice and then, idea. And that's, and, that's, and that's one of the simpler tools that you can do once you have this kind of... So, so just to kind of round this out, um, you mentioned that you have to kind of fight with with Haskell DB. So I don't, I don't assume that you're using it in every sort of production database program that you that you've built. I mean, if if, if you are, that's that's interesting. Uh, if not, what do you tend to rely on? Right. So I used that in production at my previous workplace for everything. Um, if you so, if you want something equivalent to a Haskell DB now that's modern. Um, Esquilito is kind of similar. Um, I'm not sure that it, it, it works the same way. I've not really worked with it beyond the simple query. So we're using that in production at FB Complete um, when needed. Otherwise, we're using Persistent. Um, for my own projects, I'm basically moving over to Persistent and using Esquilito. OK, so the difference between Persistent and Esquilito is that Persistent just lets you query an object like um, a person by a, a key, but you can't join. Um, you can't do you can't do joins, and you can't do SQL level functions and things like that. Whereas in Esquilito, like SQLDB, you can have a little language which maps over to SQL, so you can do things like um, you know uh, call has, uh, SQL functions which do things. Um, so yeah, when you need to do joins for for fast queries or OK, so in IRC Browse, that is a big database, and it needs custom queries to query properly, because it's you know 30 million rows. And you can't just um, query them all with persistence. So you need to do custom queries. So in that case, you need something like um, Esquilito to do custom queries, where you can apply functions. Yeah. Would, would it be possible to write that query as, say, a function or store procedure at the database layer, and then still use a simple yeah. Yeah, I think so. A view or a function. Yeah, and then just use persistent to query it. I think so. Mm -hmm. But then, yeah, then you've got to put it in the database, which is, I guess, a debate, isn't it? It's. it's, um, it's uh, I think yeah. in large web shops, it's a very hotly debated, uh, yes. especially yeah. among the operations team and the ones who have to handle deployments. Right. Indeed. Well, let's let's switch over to talk about Hal a little bit. Uh, the Haskell shell. Let's <laughs> <laughs> clarify yeah, the Haskell shell that, uh, that that you wrote and I assume play with. I, I don't imagine you use on a daily basis. That's correct. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to Hal. Yeah, I, I'm still figuring things out. Um, I still play with it. I'm still tweaking it every so often. And the main problem is um, how do you launch Arbitrary program like how do I run X monad? Do I a bind it to a name which calls the function, calls the process, and I have it in a library? Do I b um, call it by a string like just sh space and then a string with X monad in it, which is really lame? Or c is an option. Do I take every single function, uh, every single binary in my user bin directory or path? And then automatically bind those in the scope. Those are the ideas that I'm playing with. So, yeah, that's the main thing that's holding me back right now. I, I, I've been interested in this less from an interactive shell perspective, more from a shell scripting perspective, where there seems to be a big gap in opportunity right now. People don't like writing batch, but it, it happens. 
Definitely. Um, and they don't. Yes. They, what they don't want to do is write a cabal file and and some way of packaging and deploying this thing. They just want to put a Haskell script. On there. Right. You just want to have a, uh, a shebang and then some imports and then main. Yeah. I, I write all my scripts in Haskell. Yeah. Um, Unless I have to share it with someone, in which case I probably use Batch. I hate using Batch. Yeah. So for me too, shell shell scripting is a big deal. So, so you do you do a lot of shell scripting in Haskell? Yeah. Have yeah. you noticed that you actually get code reuse when you do that? Because I've never gotten code reuse out of Bash ever, aside from copy paste. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. I I have a script. So on my Linux, I have this MacBook Retina, but I run a bunch of Linux on it. And the Wi-Fi wi driver is not very good. Um, so every so often, because it's new, uh, every so often it disconnects and doesn't reconnect. So I wrote a Haskell script, which would ping Google, and then uh, if it doesn't respond in time, it restarts the Wi-Fi. And uh, I ended up writing a wrapper for the uh, network manager library, which is um, some dbus based thing. So yeah, that's that's an example of where it would have been in batch, but I moved it into Haskell. No, you do this by using a shebang with, uh, say, run Haskell as the as the command. Uh, yeah, it depends. Yeah. I've done that for some scripts, and sometimes I might actually do full cabal project because, like Rain says, eventually these scripts end up becoming useful programs, and you think, "Oh, I'm going to keep this and make it less scripty," and you want to maintain it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's an interesting when, balance. When you do want to keep it. Scripty a little bit. I, I've talked to some people putting some rather large bash scripts over, trying to, and they were frustrated that a lot of the a lot of the niceties that you get from pipes and and, and sort of the syntax of bash you lose in Haskell. Have you found anything that, that works with that? In the libraries or in the well, I'm interested to see whether pipes or conduit will fill this niche because um, they're similar. Right? It's a similar concept. When you, like the underlining type for conduit is a pipe, and pipes the library itself is pipes. Um, so, you know, grep, if, if you do tail f with the script, which is the tail and continue reading, and then you type grep, that is a sort of easy way. Right? It's continuously reading. Um, the grep is still running while some new stuff's coming in. So, yeah, that could be an application for conduit or pipes. And I know that Gabriel is trying to, or was, Interested in doing a shell based upon pipes, where you would, you know, pipe everything together with pipes. Um, yeah, do you see the Shelly library? I, I, I have. I don't remember. Library. Yeah, I think it has some kind of reader monad or something which keeps um, keeps uh, current directory in a CD in amount and things. And I think it does support piping with a kind of type operator. Um, right now in the sh in the hell shell, I'm just using uh, lazy functions right now, uh, so just piping with bind. But indeed, either conjure or pipe looks like an interesting direction to go, in, especially if you want efficiency and convenience together. Speaking of toy projects that you wrote in an evening that make me sad because I can't write things in an evening. Uh, you, wrote, you wrote an IRC server uh, called Hulk, right? Oh, right, right. Yeah, we used that um, at FB Complete for our little chats and stuff. And that uh, predates these pipe-style libraries, right? Yes, it is. Have, have you thought about whether it would be useful to incorporate something like that into Hulk? Indeed. Um, I was talking to a guy on the Haskell IRC channel who was writing an IRC server with pipes. And oh. It was pretty nice. Um, it's, it's kind of like an updated version of what I might have wrote if I started now. Um, yeah, there are some interesting when you write a server which runs for a while and uses connections and uh, sockets connections and threads because they all interact in mysterious ways. Um, like the Hulk server I wrote on DHC 6.12.3, and it worked fine for a year. Like it had enough time of a year, um, and it was fine. And then I recompiled it with 7.04 of GHC, and I discovered that there was a bug where 
an M var would um, end up empty, and then the the whole program would freeze for a particular user or something. Um, it's a notebook, so it was like what's here. But at any rate, um, I it's you, you get strange behavior, which you're not sure whether it's because GHC has improved or got a bug. But I found that that particular program. Um, Either an exception was being dealt with strangely, or software closings. Uh, but yeah, it's an interesting use case. And I maybe Pipes and Conduit with their resource handling, especially Conduit, which has I think um, very particular resource handling, would help with that kind of program. So before we run out of time, I know there's not many of us in the next year, so that you've done a lot. You've done a lot of work with the past four years. Recently releasing uh, structured Haskell. So here's your chance to plug it yes. in and tell us what it does. Yes, and I will stay out of it. Yes. <laughs> I know that you try your mics for a little while, right? And then it I, just... I, 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 keep, I, I keep coming back to it and trying it, and it keeps pushing me away. <laughs> yeah. You've you got evil mode, right? And it just, it's not enough then to be with any. It's not Emacs, it's me. Yeah, I, I, although oh, I, right, see, right. I, I did see, I took a look at your God mode uh, which for, for email, which, which does <laughs> yeah, seem to, that, to get rid of a lot of the objections. <laughs> from the yeah, hopefully. It, it certainly would save the uh, RSI. That, it, interesting sort of adding Vim style modality, which people, it seems like most Emacs people are obliged to not want that. I, I do know a guy who, who <laughs> hates Emacs but uses it for certain features and he always uses I think evil mode or, or one of the modes that turns on the IT. Mm -hmm. so, but but back to the original question. So structured structured Haskell mode. Um, oh yes yeah, structured Haskell yeah, how, I, 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 do you feel confident that it's ready for mainstream use? Are you still working on it or where is it at? Right. Um, I would say it's it's definitely ready for use in use. Um, with the proviso that you don't use um, all of the features. <laughs> so the, the re more recent features, the whole thing is very experimental. Okay, so ideally I would be using Lambda and everybody would be using Lambda. But structure tassel mode is a um, is a minor mode which enhances normal Haskell mode. Um, provide structured operations. Um, primarily structured, but mostly structured operations upon the AST and not the concrete syntax tree. So the the core features are things like navigation, right? So take me to the parent, take me to the end of the parent, um, kill this whole node and move it somewhere else. Those are the core things and they work fine. Um, Reindentation, so you know, if, if I change some code and some code below needs to go backwards or forwards, it does this automatically. Yeah. When, when I was able to determine the uh, current key combinations and use of the foot pedal to activate these things, I was very impressed <laughs> by them. Right. How many foot pedals did you have? Like, <laughs> yeah. Only the once. I was very limited. Right, I, right. I, I really like the idea of semantic editing, and it's a shame that editors historically don't support that. Was it really yeah. difficult to bolt that on? Do you have to do just a lot of send text out to an external program? I know you wrote a, a thing in Haskell that's basically the engine for this. That's right, yeah. So I pass this to Haskell SRC EXTs, which parses and say, it. say, hey, go rewrite this and then give it back to me and I'll stick it back in. Um, actually, not that part. Just the parsing okay. right now. Um, oh, okay. It could do rewriting, yes, and maybe that would ah, be a good way so to get it. So it and then, but the re so the rewriting is in Emacs. Yeah. That's well, right. that's that's crappy because then I can't port the rewriting to Vim because right. have to. <laughs> and, then, and then I'd have to write it in Vim script, which I'm not going to do. Yeah, that's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> yeah, that might be a good way to get reuse. Like start porting those things over. Yeah. Because yeah. right now it's all in Emacs. Vim is a is a nice editor with the worst language ever. Emacs is a nice editor with a with a great language, and I just wish I could make my brain use it. Yeah, it lacks good key bindings. That's definitely true. Yeah. I've tried Evil, and it always the abstraction always breaks in ways that are incredibly frustrating for me because right, it me seems too. like 
if you get a you know if you get a hundred different Vim users, you're going to have a hundred different you know sets of 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 bindings that they use regularly. Everyone has a different way of using Vim, and people only write the stuff they care about, and then you just find all the holes they left behind. Also, free mics, yeah, true. Mm -hmm. Uh, so structured has mode is pretty much ready. Um, you can uh, so it's a minor mode, so it changes Haskell mode slightly by rebinding some stuff. So you can enable only a few things. I think in the readme I put that you can disable whatever deep you don't want to use. But I would hope that editors generally for Haskell go in this direction. It tries to be balanced. It's somewhere in between normal Haskell mode or normal Vim or whatever. Editor use of line and between Monday. So it's kind of a, a bridge between those two. It's still plain text. You're still editing a normal, you know, a document of text. But you can do operations on it which are kind of structured. Whereas, you know, in Lambda, it's the opposite stream, everything is structured versus the other stream. So I want it to be practical for you. I use it for everything. I use it in my daily code, I use it on complex code bases with lots of stuff in there that's you know non-standard stuff, and works pretty much fine. The only thing it doesn't work on right now, I guess I can mention this, is uh, um, C preprocessor, um, C preprocessor lines directives, um, because that's tricky. But otherwise, everything basically works. And I'm adding stuff all the time to it. Um, so, yeah. so people can find out more about this if they're interested in your YouTube channel. Right. Are you yes. going to be continuing? Yeah, the, the project to project continue. You plan to continue Sorry. with these. Sorry for the time. You plan to continue with the uh, with making some videos about uh, either using Emacs for Haskell or running Haskell. And so on. Yeah, that would be cool. Maybe all three of us could collaborate there. Um, yeah, I, I would like to suggest that you uh, you do some very uh, nice videos and then. Do not not write them for six months and have everyone yell at you. <laughs> right. That's what you should not do, so don't do that. Yeah. Just be consistent. To, yeah, just dedicate your life to for them. Also, also, be prepared if you, you know, do decide to do this, that it, it, you have to, now you have an obligation to the community, so. Right. <laughs> Yeah, do you got yeah, I, I, I think I think everyone should make Haskell videos. I think we need more of that from people who use Haskell to do things. So please do. Yeah, especially I, I like um, the, the videos that show people thinking and doing things, uh, not just sort of the result. I really mm -hmm. like seeing that process. Yeah. Uh, so I've yeah, seen you could, of your videos. Well, yeah, you could you could us, give us videos. People will, will will like you for it until until you stop, and then they will hate you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then your name is Mud. Yeah, yeah. yeah Chris. So, actually, I would like to find out how you do those videos because yeah, they're very nice. new. New one on Emacs coming out soon. We've got yeah. that out of the actual podcast. Yeah. Oh, great! I shouldn't be plugging this uh, cool. out. Um, but, but yes, speaking, you should. I, 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 will, I, will, I will. I will plug you on uh, your behalf. It's fine. Yeah, this, is speaking, this is about you. Yeah, speaking of speaking of plugs. What what else are you working on? What else? It doesn't even have to be something you know, you're working on. What what looks interesting to you? What should people know about what's happening in the last few years? Well, that's caught me off guard. Uh, Take your time. Um, well, I'm working on you know toolingy stuff all the time, of course, and I have a little subject where I want to um, have a uh, logic language, which uses um, plain English, and so it parses your English with the control-controlled English syntax, and then converts it to data log. And there are a bunch of data log implementations in Haskell, none of which are stable. They're all kind of, oh, I wrote this on a weekend and I threw it up there. Um, there are a bunch of them, and I'm trying to find the intersection of those which is stable and fast and useful. Uh, but that is a little, a little project I'd like to do. Uh, in order to make a kind of interactive book. But, yeah, I could talk about that for a long time. It's not really, uh, fully fleshed. Yeah, uh, in interesting stuff in the Haskell world. Uh, oh, 
I was announcing a blog post soon about stackage, which might be of interest. Uh, you know, this whole package package uh, version resolution stuff is a is a pain for everybody, so that would be interesting. So yeah, maybe we can get some links and uh, put this in the show notes. Cool. Uh, Raina, I, I think I think we're about I think I think we're good for folks that are, are playing along at home with the drinking game. I would like to say rigor and laws again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and everybody check out Louie. Good one. Oh, can I leave with a question? Yes. Which is not a Haskell question, it's just a question to get in people's heads. So if you take a Mobius strip, and it's a piece of paper, which is a Mobius strip, and then you take a pair of scissors, and then you cut down the center of the Mobius strip all the way around until you get back to where you started, do you have two Mobius strips? Do you have one big Mobius strip? Or do you have one big double wrapped just piece of paper, which is not a Mobius strip? So let the audience think about their shopping and stuff. Yeah, go tape piece, go tape strips of paper together and, and attempt to cut yeah, them. Yeah, exactly. And and then and then attempt them to cut them in in twice because that's interesting too. Yes, good. That's such a cool question to leave to leave people. With. Right. I really hope people are actually going to be doing in, this. In right case now. anyone is listening to this, to this podcast, how can they sleep? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, guys, well, I guess I will talk this out here again. Okay. You've been listening to the Haskell. Take, take, take. take one. <laughs> one sec. It's, it's great that I've committed to putting this on all these videos. You've been listening to The Haskell Cast, Episode 7, with guest Chris Doan, recorded on May 8, 2014. For notes and links for this episode, visit www.haskellcast.com.